This is another story from out of southwest Virginia, Missing at Tumbling Creek. But this is from June the 1st of 2017, Marion, Virginia. This is the same area that I spoke about earlier for Donnie, Donnie Ray Billings' disappearance. This man is considered endangered. His name is Gary Shannon Earp, Jr. He was a white male, age 45, 5 foot 8, 280 pounds. He suffers from a form of mental illness that includes paranoia. He had spent a long stay in a psychiatric facility and was discharged about six months prior to his disappearance. He is disabled. His Toyota pickup truck has been accounted for. The story is, is that Earp disappeared from Marion, Virginia on June the 1st, 2017. On June 4th, his Toyota pickup truck was found parked at a gate near the top of the mountain near Tumbling Creek. This is near the Clinch Mountain Wildlife Management Area. The truck was still running and the door was open. Inside was his wallet with cash, credit cards, his glasses, a bag of uneaten Hardy's breakfast. His, a photo of his truck is posted. It was processed and they found no evidence of any kind of blood or anything like that. Loggers in the area said that they had seen the truck, seen him driving the truck at around 3 p.m. on June the 1st. Another witness reported seeing him in Saltville, which is a town nearby, on June the 2nd. He was behaving normally, and the receipt from the Hardy's food showed that it was purchased on the night of June the 2nd. A search of the area around the vehicle turned up no sign of him, and he has never been heard from again. His family says that he enjoyed going camping in the Tumbling Creek area, and he had actually only been there the weekend before he went missing. He had not mentioned returning to the area. In 2014, three years prior to his disappearance, he had pled not guilty by reason of insanity on a probation violation from an earlier conviction for child abuse. The case was still pending when he disappeared. He missed a court hearing that was scheduled for June the 1st. He didn't show up for his court-ordered community service on June the 2nd. As a result, a warrant was issued for his arrest. It was uncharacteristic of him to miss the hearing. His probation officer called him a model probationer. He had passed all of his drug tests and faithfully attended his probation meetings. He abided by the requirements to uh, control his mental health with medications and seeing his doctor. He lived with his father at the time of his disappearance and relied on disability payments. He had planned to ask the court to permit him to look for a job, and his case remains unsolved. This is another story from Southwest Virginia. In early November 2015, John Wingler Jr. snapped a photo of his 74-year-old father as he sat on the porch of his white top home. The two men hadn't always seen eye to eye, but in the recent years they had grown quite close. The younger man wanted to capture a picture of his father in that moment. About a week after this photo was taken, it would become the featured photo on a missing persons poster and would be run on local television, print, and news reports in an effort to locate John Wingler Sr., who disappeared on November the 12th. The report came in to the Grayson County Sheriff's Office from Wingler's girlfriend, that she had spoken to him the previous day but had been unable to get in touch with him that morning. Along with the man was also missing was a red Ford Ranger pickup. When investigators arrived, Captain 
Todd Perkins said the home was in slight disarray. It didn't look like it had been ransacked or nothing. Nothing appeared to be missing, but it was in disarray. A single house slipper belonging to the elder man was found in a ditch in front of his in his front yard. The wind had been especially high that day, and he thought it was possible that the slipper may have blown off of the porch. Being such a small community, even in southwest Virginia standards, Wingler was known to locals. Local people described him as a man in poor health. Perkins said Wingler never stayed too far from home. When he did go out, it was always for a short trip to the White Top Food and Gas. He would go there to buy food and alcohol. After his disappearance, due to his poor health conditions, Wingler was labeled as endangered. He couldn't drive very well, and he couldn't walk very far. He was elderly, and he had heart conditions. He would drive very, very slowly, and people in the area knew that about him. His son was working construction several counties away the day he got a call from his brother saying that his father had gone missing. The thought terrified John Jr., whose father once confided suicidal thoughts to him and told his son that if he ever followed through with it, he'd go to White Top Mountain. He called a ride to his vehicle and went straight to White Top Mountain, thinking that he would find his father there. Now, what led him to automatically assume that his father was suicidal or that his father was going to go commit suicide? I don't think that would be my first thought. And even though he says that his father confided this in him, he found some comfort in the fact that his father was not there, but this would be short-lived. Perkins said a neighbor from across the street reported seeing Wingler's lights on that night, which was not unusual. However, Wingler often had difficulty sleeping at night. But he said that that night he saw someone outside of the house. However, they reported see that they saw someone peeking out of the window blinds. As this neighbor was leaving for work that morning, she said that uh, she just assumed that it was this man. Did you see anyone else there was the question. Were there any other vehicles there? And she answered no. So they're saying someone was inside of his house that morning. His lights were on the night before. So someone was inside of his home, whether it was him or not. And someone was looking out of his window blinds that morning, whether it was him. Or maybe it was someone waiting for everybody to leave. The investigator said the sheriff's office received an unconfirmed report that day that his truck had been seen on the road that morning heading toward the White Top Food and Gas. But it had stopped and turned around and went in the other direction. This was Captain Todd Perkins, and he had investigated this case for several years until it was promoted, until he was promoted to captain. Technology limitations. In a typical missing persons investigation, they use cell phones, computers, GPS tracking, debit card transactions to track a person's whereabouts or their last known location. But in this area, there was limited cell phone service. And, and this man, that I don't even know that they said that he even owned a cell phone or a computer in his home. So they just had to go out and interview people and talk to people face to face. We know we were looking for him and his truck. So we start looking and searching. We start talking to people and following leads. None of the leads or tips panned out. He was driving a red Ford Ranger, which was an older model vehicle that had no GPS. They searched the area and they brought in uh, divers to search a small pond. Um,
Investigators tried to find anyone who may have been at odds with Wengler or, or who may have benefited from his disappearance, including his girlfriend, but no viable suspects were ever developed. Though the two were not married, Wengler had added his girlfriend to his deed to his house. Speaking with a relative of Wengler's, investigators learned that he had sought advice from a relative the day before on how to remove her from this deed. So there's speculation that he had decided he wasn't going to put the girlfriend on the deed after all, and he wanted to know how to go about changing his deed. Had he told her, I've decided I'm not going to leave my home to you and I'm taking you off of the deed. Others said that she had a financial interest in the house, and certainly whenever you have something like this and someone goes missing, you start looking at the people who would benefit. But now this girlfriend is now deceased, and she was cooperative with investigators, and she never held back any information. They could never find anything suggesting that she had had any involvement. The police say they never had a reason to suspect her of anything other than um, just that one idea that maybe the house, you know, there was no signs of foul play inside of the home. There were some things that were unusual, but not like it, it didn't look like it had been ransacked. It didn't look like there had been a fight. Nothing was really missing that was of any value that, someone might have, you know, taken to try to get money from. Sinister reports and rumors began to come in that suggest that Wengler may have been killed and dumped in a ravine on Chestnut Mountain. They thought that maybe his truck had gone over an embankment. They searched these areas. Meanwhile, John Jr. and his brother Jeff had been working with a foundation called the Awar Foundation to bring attention to missing persons cases. They were interviewed by local um, news outlets to try to get their father's picture and his story out there to the public. In the years that have followed, investigators continue to follow up on tips they are few and far between now, and nothing has ever panned out. Four years later, in April of 2019, a deer hunter stumbled upon Wingler's pickup truck in the woods about two miles from his home. Now, surely to goodness, during the searches for this man in the first few days of weeks after his disappearance, they would have looked in this area. Perkins said the truck appeared to have gone off of an old logging road near a Christmas tree farm and crashed into a tree. The truck came to a stop and was angled on a bank so that the passenger's door was facing down the slope. And they asked the same question that I asked. Why did no one see this at the time that they were all out searching? He offered up one explanation, saying that a helicopter had made two passes over that area during the searches. But he believes that there was heavy tree cover and that they were searching this field rather than the woods. It was this big open field. And so The investigator, however, pulled up Google Earth and was able to identify a red speck on the map where um, the image had been taken at the time that the truck was found. He reached out to federal authorities to find out if previous images had been stored in hopes of identifying the truck. I guess what they're saying is they wanted to see if the truck had showed up on different photos over the period of time when they had been searching for this man or if the truck had recently been brought there. 
and and there's photo here of the truck and i'm going to show you now a, a man in this man's health condition and uh advanced age may have had some trouble but the truck's not really like what you would consider to be wrecked it's like it just ran off of the road and down this embankment he could have easily and the and the passenger door is open and it looks as though someone could just very easily have climbed out of this passenger door and walked keep in mind this was an older man with health problems but would they not have found his remains in the area although his family is skeptical that the truck set crashed in the woods for four years they come up with some more sinister theories there were no signs of foul play at the scene Debris accumulated on, on and around the truck also supported that, had been, that it had been sitting there this whole time. So what they're saying is, while the truck had supposedly been sitting there for four years, it looked as though it had been. It, it didn't look like it had recently been brought there. The truck was angled on, on the bank, and the passenger door was open. There were some personal items scattered around on the ground. A wallet, a pair of glasses, a pocket knife, a cordless house phone, and but we could not find the man. At that point, Wingler had been missing for several years. The sheriff's office brought in two anthropologists from Radford University, to help with bone identification. They told us it did not surprise them that we would not find anything, taking into consideration the amount of time that had passed. I don't believe that. I mean, I, I'm no anthropologist by any means, but I mean, surely they would have found some clothes. Did he go out outdoors naked? And as far as bones, what, what happened to his skull? You know? Additionally, a wildlife biologist explained to investigators that bears have been known to carry off a 250-pound calf carcass. So they believe that if the man had laid out there and died, that animals would have carried his body away. Um... As the investigation stands, no remains have ever been found. They keep an open mind as to what may have happened to him. Without a body, we don't know the cause of death. Although he and other investigators have ruled out the possibility of foul play, they also acknowledge that there could be a scenario that he drove off the road, crashed his truck in a remote area, and couldn't find the his way back home his son however is not convinced he questions why his father would have been in that area to begin with now they said he didn't leave his home a lot but when he did he normally went to the grocery store which was just a short distance from his home and purchased what he needed and left and went back home my dad would never have been out there on that property. He wouldn't even drive through the yard, even though his truck had a four-wheel drive. So what he's saying is his father never went anywhere other than back and forth to the store. He, he wouldn't drive his truck into an area that was um, muddy, marshy, or wet because he was afraid to get it stuck. He said his father also left his driver's license behind, even though they found the wallet. So he doesn't believe that he, he, he just doesn't believe it. He believes that there was something. Had the truck been found earlier, Perkins believes the investigation would have been concluded right then. I hate that we didn't find his truck on day one. And I guarantee that if we had, we probably would have found him.
Ever since we found the truck, there's been no other leads. Nothing has been said. Nothing has come in. This case has grown cold. Well, he keeps referring back to the sheriff's officer who was, who's since been promoted, talks about, we worked this case hard, he says. We used all the resources we could. But he keeps going back, because of the location and everything, we didn't have the technology. You can't use technology that's not there. Now, I don't get that. They may not have had technology as far as GPS, cell phones, and things like that, this is what he's alluding to, that this man didn't carry a cell phone. He didn't have a GPS in his truck. How did people find missing persons before all of this stuff took place? Um, they may not have had the technology out in the woods where the truck was found, but they had forensics. I just I don't know what he's getting at there other than he just keeps saying we don't have the technology and that's kind of a poor excuse in my personal opinion this was an older man he didn't carry a cell phone and that type of thing he didn't have text messages where they could go pull this stuff up out of the cloud see who if he'd been talking to anybody his son says, I don't know where my dad is. I don't have closure. I don't know what happened to him. And I can only imagine the last few minutes of his life. He holds on to hope that someday they will get answers. He, he refers to the Bible that says everything done in the darkness will be brought to light. And anyone who has any information can contact the Grayson County Sheriff's Office at 276-773-3241. With my own personal opinion on this is, I don't know, like they said, they didn't investigate, they investigated the girlfriend angle, but they didn't find enough on her to believe that she would have killed this man just because of the home did she have sons did she have anyone in her life who may have gotten mad when they found out that this man was not going to leave her this home what about his own children were they investigated did they have alibis for that night and that morning and what leads me to kind of see this as more than just an elderly man who got confused and drove away into the woods is the fact that the truck was dro driven out into a wooded area where he would never have gone. If he had decided to get up that morning and go to the grocery store and something happened to him and he wrecked or went off the embankment, he would have been somewhere between their, his home and that store. Unless they're saying that they believe he has some kind of mental break or like um, dementia. And I don't know if they mention anything about anything like that. And did anyone gain anything from his disappearance? Was he ever declared dead? Did his family inherit his home? Did they sell it? Did they, you know, did he have bank accounts or anything that anybody would have gotten um, you know, some benefit from. The one thing that I keep, my mind keeps clicking back to is this fact that someone was looking out the blinds that morning, which the neighbor says that they would sometimes see him in the mornings. So they didn't think anything of it. But could it have been that someone killed him in his home that night put his body in the truck, drove him out there, threw some of his items in with him to make it look like he'd gotten confused and drove away. Well, maybe he really did. Maybe he really did. Maybe it really was nothing more than a case of someone getting turned around in the direction where they were going and just... But 
there's never been any traces of his body, his remains of anything other than the items that were found at the truck. And this case is still a cold case. It's still a mystery. Thanks for watching.